relations, marketing, and social media and healthcare requires making the right moves at the right time. Welcome to the overrated and underused show. Here's your host, experienced marketers Jen Jennings and Tom Testa, with special guest Adrian Stoner. Overrated and underused. The overrated and underused show. All right, Jen, we're back for another episode of Overrated and Underused. It's match, as we say up here in Boston. That's not how we say it down here in Georgia. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it is whatever you call it. It's already the third month of the year. That means it's time for him sanity. You know, I'm sure that word's getting thrown around, and but it is time to head on down to one of the biggest healthcare IT conferences in the world. Exactly. Yes. So everybody's probably listening to this as they're roaming the aisles, walking through him. So keep an eye out for our smiling or not smiling faces and if you happen to see us say hello bring us a snack because we're or a water because we're probably underfed and uh dehydrated <laughs> right <laughs> true you know what you know what? i just had an idea we should have like our first o and u giveaway not that we have anything to give away so there's <laughs> what really are nothing we, to, what give are we gonna give away? to give away a signed photo of us i don't know but here's the thing if you find us at Hims, let's take a photo of us, tweet it, use our hashtag, and we'll give you something that you'll probably <laughs> love forever. We'll give you our own tchotchke. Yeah, we'll, we'll find something from our desk. In the February show, right, we talked about pre hims prep and, and the giveaways or uh, the tchotchkes. Uh, so why not? Let's, you know, how about we give away our own? You see us, we'll take a picture of us, you tweet it, use the hashtag. I think it's a great giveaway. Okay. I, I like your planning. I like your enthusiasm. We'll, we'll discuss. We'll, we'll circle back on this. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, we've got another great episode lined up today. We're going to talk about press releases versus what we call opportunistic PR or public relations. Last episode, we talked about a lot of the marketing and the right. shot skis. <laughs> oh, I said it right this time. Pre-conference promotion. So jump into some of the, the PR side of it talking about press releases so right let's just get right into it because yeah I'm let's gonna, let's you know go on record and say that Uh-oh. <laughs> press releases are overrated overrated press releases they're a, they're a tool or a vehicle that almost every pr practitioner in the world uses so tell us right why is this news vehicle overrated well, exactly for the reason that you just said, in that they are something that every PR practitioner in the world uses. So they're yeah. not unique. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a safe go-to in that the world of public relations has evolved so much from what they used to be. And actually, mm-hmm. I'm probably not the best person to describe this process because <laughs> I've only ever written press releases on my laptop and emailed them out. I've never had to fax the press release. So Right. I'm not the one to talk to talk about, you know, how valuable they were back in the day. But now I just think, you know, they make sense in certain cases, but mm-hmm. they're definitely something that are overrated and that they, um, you know, the value of a press release isn't just, you know, okay, well, we have this great, or not even a great, we just, we have something to announce. Let's put out a press release. We launch a new website. Let's put out a press release. We signed four customers. Let's put out four press releases about it. So, yeah, I think there's a time and a place for it, but I do think it's it's overrated. Yeah, and I think if you look at any agency or internal shop using press releases, I'd say if you look at the media relations side of it and the coverage that results from those press releases, I think you'd see that it's not the vehicle or or a good means of getting media coverage because you've got to think, too. These media folks, they are getting... I mean, how many of these a day, right? When you, when you, if not more than that, hundreds. Right, right. And so you think about what you just said, you know, some people overuse them in a way of like, well, we're going to do it for everything. Uh, there's, not, there's no strategy behind it. There's no, there's, it's just more, you know, we have some news, which we think is news. Let's put a press release out. And so again, back to the media, they're, they're getting so many of them that it's tough for them to see which is really news. Um, a lot of these press releases are written without hooks too. There's really, it's just more, here's our product, here's a quote, here's our boilerplate, have a good day, put it on the website. So I think there could be a way to strategize a little bit more, use them in a way that could garner coverage. Um, and I think a lot of PR folks aren't really thinking that way. And you might say, 
gee, Tom, how do you do that? How, how, would you, how would you use those in a more strategic way? You know, I think, too, a lot of it could be in either the headline or the, the lead sentence, too, because you can use a news hook. And we're going to get, I think, into that in the next segment with that opportunistic PR. But I think you can be opportunistic with your press releases in some way, too. And you can say something like, on the heels of last month's ONC ruling, today's, you know, Company X is announcing that they are blah, blah, blah. So I think you can get a little more strategic. You can help, you know, reporters reading the press releases kind of get an idea of, you know, why this is news now and not something where John just joined Company X. I'll write about that in three months potentially. So I think that could be, you know, a way. But, but in the end, you're right. I think it's, it's just overused and you've got to have some strategy behind the amount of press releases you put out. Definitely. And I mean, it's tough to, <laughs> coming from a PR agency, to talk negatively about a press release. Really, it's how a lot of PR companies and PR professionals make right. their money. So, you know, they're, it's profitable to say, let's, let's put out a press release. I mean, it, it's kind of an easy task to do, but I hope none of our clients are listening to this. <laughs> well, no, I mean, and if they are, you know, the, the fact is that, yeah, there's still something that we as an agency do use and, the, and they are important right? Because they, they are part of the a good PR strategy. You know, we use them for things like uh, major partnerships, ma- and I say major, right? Mm-hmm. So major partnerships, major product uh, service line launches. And also, you know, we actually use them kind of like I said, in my example, even as common opportunities. So on things in the news, if you want to get an expert out there, you can do it in press release form. Our agency still uses them. But like you said, we're selective about the choices and we'll we're definitely very authentic and real about you know our feedback to client on what is really press release worthy some companies have different you know different thoughts on that they just think that everything constitutes a press release or any announcement right. needs to be you know we want to share this information with everybody so let's do a press release well that's not always the right way to share information right um, and even more so like even if it is a news angle you know, writing a personalized pitch to an editor about it or, you know, saying like, here's why this matters to your audience and here's some basic information or just kind of, you know, if if it is something that it's like, well, we just want to, we want to put it out there that John Tate is our new vice president of operations. Then put that on your website and then share it locally, share it on your social, share it with the audiences that may actually care about that announcement or talk about, you know, how that person is going to bring, you know, what they're going to bring to the company and in the future plans or make it into this larger story of well, we're bringing this person in because we're launching a new service line or, you know, yep. wh- whatever it might be. Yep. And in fact, you know, why, why should people, you know, use press releases? And you talked about a couple there posting for your website, you know, you got your website newsrooms, you know, it shows that because there are a lot of, whether it's even prospective customers or or media, if they stumble across your website, that, you know, it is a good place to have your press releases there because it shows that you've been active, that you've had some news, you've had some things to say about your company. So I think that's uh, one good reason why it might not be overused. And then I know there's things like SEO as well. Yeah, I think... SEO is, I mean, there's some debate over how valuable act- there actually is with a wire mm-hmm. service. And, you know, there used to be a lot more weight because of wire service would put it out to all these sites that would pick up the news and would link back. And it's just, right. but that's just not the case anymore with Google's a- algorithm. So the value of SEO, I mean, having the press release out there in, in one capacity is, is fine, but mm-hmm. whether it's on your website somewhere or shared on social, I think is, is valuable, but I just think, I think the larger discussion is that I'm kind of not saying don't ever do a press release, but be more selective in the topic that you're putting press releases out about because editors get so many of these press releases. I would love to take a poll and really find out how many they actually read. How many do they open? Because I imagine they really only open the ones from Companies that like big companies that they're they're following or or major announcements that they you know think or have heard about or people that they know and have good relationships with. But even in those cases, if it's if it's crappy news, then they're they're just yep. they may open it um, because they know the person sending it, 
but they're not going to do anything with it. You know, even if it's, if it's not newsworthy, then it's not. But I think what's more valuable in those cases is you know, more personalized outreach beyond just putting a press release out there on a wire service and expecting results from that because they'll tell you there's a lot of hits, but that's not the case. Cut her mic. What is she saying? She, she, she doesn't mean that. But yeah, no, I think you're right. You know, the bottom line here is although they are definitely used quite a lot, Press releases, they, they still are an important vehicle for distributing the, your company's top news, that's for sure. But again, we're just trying to really come at the angle of just be a little more selective. You know, I think any, any of the media who are listening to us are probably going to be grateful to hear that as well. Well, now we're on to the next segment, Jen, and it's, uh, we're going to talk about opportunistic public relations and how that's underused. I can't wait for the episode where we talk about a topic that I can actually pronounce. <laughs> Why? Go ahead, say we it. Had, we had Chotsky's last episode. Yep. And now we have all together okay. with opportun- You can say it. Opportun. Op- no, op- you can't. Opportunistic <laughs> PR. You've added five syllables to that extra syllables <laughs> to that word. Opportunistic public relations, Jen. What do you think about opportunistic PR and why it's underused? Well, yeah, I think it is, it's definitely underused in that some of our clients don't even do it enough, yeah. regardless of how much we beg, because it's just, it's not the easy tactic. It's, it's not the easy way out. It's not, okay, well, we'll just craft this press release and send it through all our channels and get the sign off. It's, you know, really having to be creative and selective and understanding the industry to be able to tie it into something that's happening. So it's right. making relevant conversations happen and relate it to your company and your expertise in a way that that matters and not, you know, I mean, there's, there's a fine line and it, every scenario is different. So that's why it's not this like templated thing that's easy for a lot of companies. So I think that's why it is underused. Yeah, no, even opportunistic, it can have a negative flair to it, you mm-hmm. know, but, but when you think about it, uh, you know, most journalists too, they're, they're really only going to care about news if it's, if it's something that really pertains to their beat. And I think a, a lot of PR practitioners, they got to do a little more research and they got to see, you know, what these reporters are writing. So, and sometimes I think a lot of reporters get stuff that isn't relevant to their beat or, or even their publication at times. Again, journalists, they care about if it's a topic they're passionate about, if it's something they're covering, or in the end, hey, if they, you know, maybe owe you a favor, you know, you've helped them out in the past and they're like, sure, you know, I'll write about this. But with opportunistic PR, like you said, it, it's kind of the window gets even tighter because I, I see it also as something where it's, you know, breaking news. So something happens that day and you want to, you want to scramble to get your expert your your executive out there on that topic in general i think people don't take enough advantage of like reading what's happening that day and we're all busy we get it we we, especially on the agency side we're doing you know 20 other things as well but i think reporters too they're scrambling they're looking for sources i mean they do have their own rolodex if that's still what people use maybe their iphone i don't know what people use oh holy cow well i have mine right here near my abacus hang on let me just put that in there but they have, so they have their go-tos, right? But I think there's also the opportunity on a breaking news story to get a fresh voice out there. And that's usually what I'll often say in, in a pitch, you know, for a fresh take or a fresh voice on, on this breaking news topic, talk to my client. Right. That's also kind of one of the reasons why I think it's, it's underused in that, you know, you really have to be able to respond quickly to and, and have your company, your subject matter experts available. Very true on short notice to respond to to breaking news or or timely things that are happening in the industry and be available for their comments. I mean, because these news cycles are short. They're they're getting shorter with self-report, self-publishing and social media and everything. So nobody wants to wait three days to get an interview with somebody about a topic. They're just going to move on to somebody else that can talk about it. Yeah, and it's funny you say that short news cycle because and how quickly people want news out there. And I think that another good strategy could be for an executive who has, let's say, a personal Twitter account to even tweet something about breaking news, too, because I would say that's even more effective if you have a media following, which a lot of folks, you know, a lot of these executives as they're building their profiles like that, too, because there are certainly plenty of times where I've seen media peruse social media they peruse twitter and uh, and they're going to get some good sources i've never been a news reporter i've never been an editor but i yeah. think if i was and there was some breaking story or some specific topic that i really wanted to cover 
my first place would probably be Twitter to see who's talking about this and who is offering like a perspective um, or even, you know, having some halfway intelligent tweet about a subject yeah. or an opinion. I think that would be probably my, my first, my yep. first stop. You know, there's this author, well, I don't know if he's an author, but a gentleman wrote a book. His name is David Meerman Scott. I think I just gave him the profession of, a, of, of author, but uh, <laughs> he wrote this book called Newsjacking, right? And that's a term that, to be honest with you, I wasn't very familiar with that term up until a couple months ago. I mean, this is something that I had never heard about. And it's basically, it's, it's kind of exactly what we're talking about. It's, it's taking advantage of breaking news stories to promote your brand. Though, if you are newsjacking or even being opportunistic, I think you still have to be a little careful about things because sometimes, and again, in my past life, not now at the agency, but in my past life, we used, uh, I've worked with experts who have wanted to uh, inject themselves into almost every news story, and it can have a negative effect. It really can. Right. And obviously, you have to have some tact along with it. If there's almost like a tragic story or something, exactly, that, that's not the that's not the time or the place. That's not the the story to kind of jump in on and say, well, we we could have prevented this, or we could have. I mean, it's kind of not the scenario at that moment. Right. But there are good opportunities too. Like don't be opportunistic in a negative way when you're taking advantage of something tragic or don't kind of roam too far outside of your expertise. But a good example too was actually, you know, again, since we're we're talking hymns, right? Last year at this time or a little earlier, I think hymns was in February last year. ONC, uh, they announced their information blocking proposal too. So the proposed rules for that. So that's where, that's a situation where one of the, the top government agencies was announcing some new news and it was going to impact thousands of organizations, thousands of people, maybe millions of people. So that was a great opportunity to, to try and, you know, you know, the reports were covering that story and to getting uh, your expert who probably may have even been on the floor at HIMSS, as a matter of fact, in touch with that expert. So I think that's a, a good way of being opportunistic. There, there's no shortage of legislative issues. I mean, like in regulatory things. So, you know, CMS puts out tons of right. rules and, uh, yep. you know, they do proposed rules, draft rules, final rules. So there's, there's plenty of comment periods and right. times to, you know, if you're mm -hmm. directly involved with, you know, what the rule is about. Right. Like yeah. the information blocking rules. So that's why I think Kim's is a great... It's a great chance to, to kind of, because news seems to always break at him. So I think, you know, while everyone's here, it's a something to be on the lookout for, for sure. Definitely. So I think we, we've kind of covered this um, and really kind of honed in on the fact that, you know, we're, we're recommending that companies really be more strategic in their outreach and their, you know, media relations efforts. And I know I'm, uh, it's easier said than done for sure. But I think the results that you would get from more personalized outreach, more personalized stories, more, you know, research into the reporters that are really interested in this particular topic or yep. will go a long way versus blasting out a press release just to have the news out there. Now that we've come to another, uh, the end of another overrated and underused segment, you've heard about, like Jen said, press releases versus opportunistic PR. We're also happy to hear from you guys. So again, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can hit us up on Twitter or email us as well. So let's roll into Clinician's Corner. Let's do it. Clinician's Corner. A small segment where we relate, you know, a lot of what we talk about and our experiences are with the vendor side of healthcare and technology, but definitely still relevant to physician, clinician, audience, and, and practitioners. So, right. you know, we talked briefly in the last segment about media relations, public relations, press releases, and really just being in tune with what's happening in the industry and being able to relate how your company and your products or, you know, your services kind of fit into that. So that's especially true for any business. I think any business in any industry, but, you know, relating to clinicians, knowing that being in tune with, with what's happening in the media and being seen as a thought leader is, is really invaluable for advancing and growing your, your customer base and your practice or your brand, um, you know, as a clinician. 
But you're right, though, you know, because it's great for, you know, growing your practice and it also can be good for, for retention, too, because I think like, you know, if there's a local, you know, flu season, let's say, and even patients within your practice may see a local a local interview uh, in the local business journal, the local daily about your, you know, a Q&A with your doctor on tips for, for flu season and, 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 you know, preventing flu as best you can. I still think that's great. They say, oh, wow, there's my physician. There's my doctor out there. You know, um, they're, they're a go to and they're, they're brilliant. Or, you know, if you're, you know, have a strong email marketing program, as I think you should, being able to, to share resources, sharing tips for flu season as the example, or, right. you know, a, a simple reminder to your patients or, you know, anybody in your contact database, like the importance of the flu shot and how easy it is and that your office, you know, offers it without an appointment or, you know, like during these set times or right. just kind of relaying some information and in that. You know, yeah, patients know they can go to the doctor and get a flu shot, but reminding them to get it because sometimes people need those reminders. And again, even to pull it back to the media relations side, some of the local publications and local media, they love to just tap experts in their own community, right? So these are the folks that they cover day in and day out that the people that their readership cares about too. I think having, you know, being kind of a go-to in some ways on a local level for a clinician can be very beneficial. You don't necessarily have to have the press contact because some people may be listening and saying, ah, geez, yeah, I'm a physician, but I'm a doctor. That's what I do. I, I don't have time to go out there and see who's covering this for this publication or that publication. Well, the good thing is, as in our case at the agency, right, we know we work with a lot of vendors and their customers are the physicians. So the physicians can actually go to the vendors and say, hey, look, I'm looking to get out there on this topic. You know, I use your telehealth service. I'm available if you'd like. So even through that vendor relationship who potentially is working with an agency, you can get some kind of added visibility. That's definitely a great idea. And I, I mean, you know, from the, the vendor perspective, they would love that. They love to have their right. customers be advocates. Um, and if you're a provider that's using, you know, a telehealth service from a vendor, then, you know, definitely reaching out and just kind of making that a relationship and a partnership and say, Hey, I'm right. willing to, I'm willing to speak at conferences. I'm willing to provide some insights to editors or whoever may be wanting more information about, you know, the, the real use cases. No, I totally agree, Jen. So basically, you know, that's, that's what the clinician's corner is all about. As you said in the beginning of the segment is where we, you know, we talked about press lists, we talked about media relations and, and our goal here is to, is to kind of just showcase how, how even, you know, at the physician level, at the local practice level, you know, they can use some of these tips as well to help with their visibility, their expertise, and again, both to grow their practice and, and ultimately to retain some of those, those new patients that they receive. Definitely. Yeah. I think the, um, the advice we give is, is great for everyone. Inbox with Adrian. Hi everyone. And thanks for coming back to the hottest five minutes in radio inbox with Adrian. This month we had a nice and easy question that came via our at Ander underscore enter Twitter account. It's from our very good friend, John Lynn at tech guy from healthcare scene. He asked, how do you prove the ROI of PR? I love PR and think that there's value in it, but how do I prove that ROI to my skeptical boss who isn't sure how to justify the spin on PR? You know, Adrian, that's a great question from John. But you know what, unfortunately? Ah, shucks, that's all the time we have on today's show. Thanks, <laughs> tune in next time on the next Over and Under Radio. Bye! Thanks for Bye. listening to the Overrated and Under all right okay just kidding john but we'll definitely right. have to repay you for that question when we had to hit make in, in vegas in a couple months yeah thanks for the real softball john that's a question that we and probably anybody that works in pr gets all the time from you know companies that they're they're working with because everybody in this age of data and numbers and cares about, you know, how can we track this? What, you know, what quantifiable things can we put against our, our PR measurement? And I'd love to, to offer a one solid answer, but, but my friend Tom will. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's kidding aside though, you're right. We could probably talk for hours on this topic. What, what's measure success is different based on the client, really, right? So some customers, some clients, you know, measuring our ROI could be as simple as, or not as simple as, because it's not an easy task, as we talked about in previous episodes, but even getting uh, media coverage, right? So those who, who just, you know, can count media placements and say, 
well, okay, this month we've got five placements and then they're in these publications. So I consider that a great success because if we were to advertise in those publications, right, if you kind of compare the ad rates versus the PR pieces, you're probably paying a ton more than, than you would for your average retainer. Yeah, I mean, I think it really boils down to that there's not just one simple accounting equation that you can right. say times the hours invested and the number of placements and this is the, you know, ROI on poor expenditure. But I mean, there's really that additional intangible value um, that needs to be considered. Yeah. And I think on that intangible side is I also think the uptick potentially in brand awareness through your PR efforts. So I think it's things like, you know, everyone's going to be at HIMSS and if folks are saying, oh, wow, I, I, I read that story about you in Healthcare IT News or I saw that, you know, social media push or things like that. So I think there's kind of those, I consider them intangibles because they're not, I mean, how do you measure them? But it, it's again, that reputation building that happens. And when you start to hear it from prospects or other industry colleagues, things like that. I mean, that's a, in my opinion, a good way to show that PR is working. Right. And it's not necessarily, I mean, when you're talking about like a, from the marketing side, like a, you know, we do email marketing nurture campaigns where you're continually putting out content um, relevant to specific audiences. So I look at PR as another part of that type of campaign where we're nurturing the industry and these prospective buyers with content um, about issues and different articles. And you're probably not going to have a prospective customer call you and say, hey, I just saw this feature in healthcare IT news and it just, I immediately had to call you. But mm -hmm. over time, you're building brand loyalty, you're more people may be recognizing your brand, you have a better market positioning, you can do some comparative analysis like where it's your company against competitive organizations and, you know, during yep. a time span, how much you're being covered versus yep. your competitors. So, I mean, there, there are some different KPIs and things that you can put against PR, but they're really specific to your company goals. And I think what a lot of companies need to understand um, is that it, it's just not that simple one plus two equals three. Like there's a lot of intangible value behind PR that builds and builds over time. Yep. Well, that's another episode of Overrated and Underusing the Books. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We are sponsored by Anderson Interactive and can be heard weekdays at 10 a.m., 6 p.m., 2 a.m. Eastern on Healthcare Now Radio. You can always email your inbox with Adrian questions to hello at Anderson I, that's the letter I, dot com. Or you can tweet us at Jen underscore Jennings, Tom underscore Testa, or Adrian underscore Stoner. And of course, don't forget to use the hashtag Over Under Radio. Thanks for listening to the Overrated and Underused Show with your host, experienced marketers Jen Jennings and Tom Testa, and special guests Adrian Stoner. Overrated.